Hello friends and trumpeters, Stanley Friedman here, coming to you sequestered in my home in Memphis, Tennessee, USA. Over the years, I've received many requests for information about my solo trumpet composition, Solus, which is published by Editions BIM, Switzerland. I made this video to give you some background on how I came to write the piece, some interpretive ideas, and some other in insights, the structure of the piece, etc. Even though I've been composing mostly for voice, orchestra, and mixed chamber ensembles in recent years, Solus, of course, is in a special place in my heart, and so I'm going to talk to you about that today. Solus was composed in 1974 1975 when I was working on a doctorate in composition at the Eastman School of Music where my principal teacher was Sam Adler. One day I was in a coffee shop with some of the other bearded pseudo-intellectual composers and the topic of the day was Sequenza Five for solo trombone by Luciano Berrio, which was a fairly new piece at the time. Uh, now this piece is famous for its extended techniques and theatrics. And someone asked me, is there anything comparable for trumpet? And at the time, there wasn't, so I wrote one. Um, I decided up front, though, that I would depart from the burial model in a few significant ways. I would compose a multi-movement work, as opposed to single movement, uh, a multi-movement piece in which the theatrics and the extended techniques, uh, while conspicuous, would be secondary to the overall musical structure of the work, as opposed to the burial, which I regard as a piece of theater that requires a musician. I wanted solos, solos to be a piece of music requiring the musician to be theatrical. I composed the movements in the order in which they appear, and I modeled them very loosely on classical forms to give the listener something familiar in a piece that otherwise might seem a bit alien. After completing movement one, uh, I realized it would be a mistake to continue in that same very serious, strict vein. So I struck out in a different direction. The music evolved into a kind of uh, satire of itself, sort of a thumbing my nose at the Eastman New Music establishment of the time. Uh, Solus is based on a 12-pitch row that is presented very clearly in the first full phrase. They're all 12 there. I realized uh, only a few years ago that I had accidentally borrowed the first few intervals uh, of the row from the Desenclos uh, trumpet concerto. Uh, there's a very brief statement in a cadenza and it disappears and it's never heard from again. My Eastman trumpet professor, Sidney Meir, lovely gentleman, uh, wanted me to work on that piece, but it was too hard. Uh, maybe I subconsciously borrowed those intervals as a gesture of defiance. Anyway, uh, movement one in movement one, the row is treated in a traditional serial fashion, but with small cells of a few pitches repeated here and there. Over movements two and three, the row is fragmented more and more with transient suggestions of tonality. In movement four, uh, only a fragment of the original row appears near the end of the piece. The bulk of the pitch structure of the fourth movement is based on the few tones available through the open tubing, which I'll address in a few minutes. Solus is a programmatic work. It tells a story. It's kind of a mini opera in a way. Uh, although I confess I was not fully aware of the story until many years uh, after I'd written the piece, after I had played it many times and heard other people's interpretations of it. It's the story of a psychological journey uh, from fierce assertion in the first movement to insecurity and self-doubt in the second to faked confidence and, uh, and uh, 
then a total mental breakdown in the third movement, and finally in the fourth, a complete psychotic dissociation. Humor and pathos exist side by side in solos. Playing it is a safe way for trumpeters to uh, experience every performer's worst nightmare, totally losing it on stage. Some of the extended techniques in solos were little explored or entirely novel at the time I wrote them. We'll hear some of these in a few minutes. Uh, today, though, these sounds are much more familiar and have been borrowed by other composers. I don't mind this at all. Solace stands on its own merits and is only enhanced by other interpretations and these sounds being used and borrowed by other composers. That was the original idea anyway. I wanted to expand the, how the trumpet could be presented to the world. The extended techniques include uh, valve slide glissandi. This is kind of a portamento, portamento kind of trombone effect. Um, mostly with the third valve slide. Uh, there are lip bends, there are pitch bends, there are wah-wah effects with harmon mute. Uh, this is familiar enough stuff now. But at the time, this was only existed in jazz, uh, by jazz trumpet players. Uh, in the legit world, that sort of sound was not used. Um, there are pedal tones, notes below the normal range of the trumpet, and assorted growls and flutters, and of course, the infamous open tubing technique in the last movement, uh, in which I remove the second valve slide. Well, if you can see it, it's a very tiny bit of tubing that only affects the second valve, only works when the second valve is pushed. Otherwise, the trumpet plays normally. But through this open tubing, when I do use the second valve, uh, you get a very limited range of very slippery pitches, just a few notes. Uh, it's a very eerie, strange, otherworldly effect. Uh, I got the idea from trombonists who are moving their F attachment slides and playing through their open tubing with the trigger. Uh, it didn't come because I uh, forgot to replace the tubing when I was cleaning my trumpet. I've joked about that, but it's not true. I discovered that having um, removed this short second valve slide, the trumpet still played normally, as I said, as long as I don't use the second button. But the second button, you get that weird thing uh, where the sound actually emanates from that open uh, tubing. It, this uh, allowed me to exploit this for a, a kind of an instantaneous on stage, off stage effect, so I can have sort of a dialogue with myself, and that's how I constructed the movement. There are many excellent videos and CD recordings of solos. The excerpts I'll play for you here are from my own CD, uh, Ode Records, New Zealand, The Lyric Trumpet, which was recorded way back in 1989 when I otherwise was engaged as principal trumpet with the wonderful New Zealand Symphony Orchestra. Uh, I should tell you the music is being played back through my computer now and the sound quality will not be uh, as good as it is in the original recording which was brilliantly engineered by Sam Negri. Movement one is all about growth. Each phrase begins conservatively in terms of range and dynamics and gestures and expands before contracting and pausing. And the next phrase begins conservatively, expands even greater and contracts and even greater, and so on.
music restarts and expands even more. This is a few lines down. To achieve a truly compelling performance, the trumpeter must capture the sense of growth, retraction, growth again, that permeates and builds gradually through the movement. Uh, pacing and dramatic timing are crucial. This is Remember, this is a piece of theater. It's about drama. In movement two, uh, the player and the listeners both should be slightly off balance. Uh, there's a kind of a question, is the piece a joke or is it serious? Where is it going? That's deliberate. It's kind of a game of musical peekaboo. The music uh, sort of peeks out of hiding and then retreats again back into the shadows. Uh, this movement is transitional in nature and sets up the fireworks to come. I'll play just a little bit of the second movement. Not harming me. And by the way, that last note of that phrase was a pedal C. It's a low C uh, in the middle of the bass clef staff, uh, which is quite a bit lower than the normal range of the trumpet, but that note is quite producible, producible with a harmony. It's not really so difficult. In movement three, the first section mocks the technical virtuosity of a pompous cornet soloist. This was the image I had in my mind. Some character with a uniform and lots of medals and showing off. And it starts out uh, played in a straight mute. This is a wonderful wood mute by Tom Clary. The soloist character then launches into this really sentimental, syrupy displayed display. Uh, it's kind of a drunken waltz. <laughs> But then, every performer's nightmare, the, the soloist character suffers a, a memory lapse and panics and 
has a complete nervous breakdown right there on stage. It's every performer's worst nightmare. Anything goes there. I encourage players to do anything. The only mistake you can make is being too conservative. Just go crazy with it. Uh, in movement four, the player surreptitiously removes this second valve slot. I kind of hide this usually behind the music stand pop and place it where people can't see it. I also turn slightly away from the audience uh, this will enhance the difference in the tone quality between the normal open uh, open sound of the trumpet and the sound that comes through this missing piece, uh, piece of uh, tubing here. Uh, the, the opening fanfares should sound otherworldly, distant, like distant bugle calls, far away. There's a hint of Mahler's Second Symphony in this idea. And uh, by the way, to achieve the right pitches, and they're very slippery. They're, um, I, I have written uh, a whole series of new fingerings. These are different fingerings than trumpeters normally use. Uh, you have to learn these things, and it's a bit tricky, but it's it's very doable. People manage to do it somehow. Uh, anyway, by contrast to that very quiet strange opening. Uh, when I do play the notes uh, through the normal trumpet, uh, the normal fingerings, uh, I get uh, a loud, a fortissimo that's almost crushing in its intensity. When I premiered Solus at Eastman uh, all those many years ago, as I was playing the last movement, uh, out of the corner of my eye I saw a small child, a little toddler, uh, tiptoeing down the center aisle of Kel Kelburn Hall. He was obviously fascinated by this strange effect I was getting. He was coming closer and closer, and sure enough, when I had launched into the first fortissimo B-flat, he screamed and ran away. And I knew I had achieved the proper effect. Um, soon after the premiere, I was given the opportunity to play solos for the great Los Angeles Philharmonic uh, principal trumpeter and new music expert, the late great Tom Stevens, who was visiting Eastman as a guest artist. Uh, after I played the first page, Tom stopped me and said, Hmm, very interesting. Now, do you want this the way you wrote it or the way you just played it? Okay, 
Point taken, Tom. Thank you very much. He was right. My playing was sloppy, and so was my notation. So I fixed up both. Uh, Tom became a great friend and mentor. And I owe him much, and I miss him. I once played solace at the home of a uh, tuba virtuoso, Roger Bobo, who was also at the Los Angeles Philharmonic at the time. Uh, he lived out in Topanga Canyon outside of Los Angeles. And as I was playing, I was stopped in my tracks by this sudden uh, raucous cries. And I didn't know what was going on. And I thought somebody was being murdered right outside the house. But it turns out there were peacocks roaming the grounds. And I guess my playing had driven them into a mating frenzy, and that was their calls. You, know, you never know what effect your mu music is going to have on others. Uh, another time I played solos at a very conservative religious college. And uh, they, people there, the good folks, were not used to modern music. And as I was playing the third movement, they clearly were becoming very uncomfortable and were very concerned that I was actually having a nervous breakdown on stage. And I had to stop playing and say, it's okay, folks, it's, it, it's part of the show, and please don't call 911. Solace was written for myself, of course, uh, and for many years I was the only one who played it. I never dreamed it would become uh, an established work in the repertoire or that it would tell, I guess, a universal story. I used to think the piece had too many technical hurdles to become very popular among trumpet players, but the international level of virtuosity has exploded now. There are so many fabulous players all over the world that solace is really not so hard anymore. Uh, so I'm very content to sit back now be a composer, and let others do the heavy, heavy lifting trumpet-wise. I look forward to hearing you play solos and my other trumpet music very soon. Uh, thanks for watching. Stay safe. Be well. Please be in touch. Bye-bye.